English, uh, sometimes there is a language barrier. So I will speak in English. I will try not to speak too fast, but please uh, stop me if I'm too fast, and especially for the students, of course. And I, I will take questions in Spanish. I can translate what I say in Spanish if it's not clear. So uh, I, I'm just hoping that uh, there will not, uh, the language barrier will not be a too much problem. So uh, please interrupt me at any time. Um, there are no stupid questions, so ask any questions. Sometimes a question that you think is the simplest is some of the most complex to answer. So interrupt me at any time. Uh, for me, it feels a bit strange to be doing this hybrid format, so I'm, I'm not sure if I should look at the people down here in the screen or you in the auditorium. But in any case, it's great to be here. It's really fantastic. It's my first in-person meeting since the, the start of this pandemic. So it really feels great uh, both to see you offline, but especially to see you here in the auditorium live. Uh, and OK, so thanks for being here. And uh, let, let, let me show the, the plan of the talk, which changed already a little bit. Um, you won't be able to see my mouse, but uh, bear with me. So the first part uh, will be an introduction to gravitational lensing, general introduction. Uh, and we'll not have a break. Uh, there's written break here, but because of, uh, of uh, organizational things, uh, the break will be after the second part, okay? So the first part will be just an introduction, no hands-on. And then for the second part, uh, we'll use this GitHub that you see there. Uh, so please click if you can, and uh, you'll be, uh, 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 you open the GitHub, you'll see some uh, My Binder link below the explanation. So if you click on the My Binder, uh, I'll better show this to you. Um, let me switch. OK. So once you open this Git repository, if you follow this link, uh, it's Cosmo Ops slash FOF underscore lensing underscore 2022. So this is the repository. Once you go there, you click on launch my binder, okay? So here, launch binder, because this will take a couple of minutes. So we will only use this, oops. Okay, it worked a few minutes ago. Not sure what's going on now. Same network. Okay, if you people can try this in this auditorium to see if it will work. It, it did work from here, the same network, I think. Um, Yes. Okay, anyway, uh, if I'm not able to do it, it won't be a big problem, but please try. Um, it would take a couple of minutes to install all the environments, all the prerequisites you would need, uh, but um, it would be useful for the next block. But I think we have to solve this. And do you know what's, what's going on, this error? Okay. Okay, maybe it would be less hands-on that what we hold, let's see. Okay, anyway, going back to the, to the outline. So the idea is today we'll have this introduction, then we'll have a, a, a specific part on microlensing. Uh, we'll have some notebooks to play with that you see here, light curve, new lens model, and uh, some uh, dark matter notebooks. I'm not sure if I will be able to play with them, but you will be, if, so I, I can guide you. And then tomorrow we'll have a first block on strong lensing, also with uh, some notebooks to play with, uh, and then uh, uh, on weak lensing. But the difference with respect to this outline is that we'll have the coffee break after, not in, uh, in between the blocks, okay? Uh, and again, just before we start, do you have any questions? Okay, great. So let's start. My name is Martin Mackler. I'm a researcher in the University of San Martin in Buenos Aires, and I'm also from the Brazilian Center for Physics Research. Um, and so let's start with a super quick and brief uh, historical introduction. Um, the idea of deflection of light comes from uh, a long time, but let's say the modern idea based on, on, uh, on general relativity uh, is, it started in 1907 when Einstein uh, thought about the equivalence principle. So if, uh, if you think that uh, uh, um, basically the idea is the equivalence principle uh, uh, seen from now is the idea that uh, uh, gravity is geometry. And if uh, 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 massive objects, they feel geometry, then light should feel. So Einstein thought in, in 1907 that uh, light should also feel gravity. So the trajectory of light should be bended uh, by gravity. And in 1911, 1912, he made the first calculations of the, the, the selection of light. General relativity was not a complete theory. 
uh, but he made uh, some calculations that I will show uh, about the uh, light deflection, finding multiple images, and so on. And he immediately thinks about testing. That's something I want to emphasize about Einstein because people think of Einstein like a theoretical physicist, theory, theory. And he was a theorist, of course, but his mind was uh, test things, things that should be observable, was physics, was to, be, to, to, to make predictions that could be testable, falsifiable. So as soon as he has this idea of the bending of lights, he thinks of a way to measure that, and the natural way would be to see that once you have a massive body uh, in front of a star, then the position of the star should be shifted, right? The, the most massive nearby body that we know is the sun, so this should be, uh, we should see the light deflection of, uh, of a star close to the sun. Of course, you cannot see this normally, but during a total eclipse, you can. So immediately, he urged people at the observatory in, in Germany, uh, the observatory of, uh, of forgot where in Germany, uh, he, he wrote a letter to Irene Frodlis, which was the director, urging him to measure. And if you see the, the drawing, there is a number 0.84 arc seconds. So that's the, the, the light deflection that he predicted at that time uh, and urged people to try to measure during an eclipse. And, and this, is, this is the original letter. And then the first attempt to measure this light deflection was in 1912. It was an Argentinian expedition that uh, started in this observatory, right? It was led by uh, Charles Perrin, which was the director of the observatory of Cordova. Uh, he actually was in Berlin in the, with Orin uh, Freudlich, and so he came uh, to know what was going on. Then he organized his expedition to Brazil, uh, to uh, a, city, uh, uh, a city named Pristina. And what happened is that it rained. So that's a picture of the expedition. You see, there was no eclipse. Okay, so in, this was the uh, Observatory Astronomical de Córdoba expedition. This is Charles Perrin, the lead. In 2014, the director, I don't know if it was the director uh, still, but uh, Irene Freudlich uh, led an expedition to Crimea Peninsula, which was Russia, then Ukraine, and now, well, it's a big problem, but you see that there was already, during World War I, uh, a disputed territory. So they were there to see the, the eclipse. Uh, but there was a war, and they were arrested, and they could not see the eclipse because they were in jail and the equipment were uh, com confiscated. So in between, uh, the, uh, after 1914, in 1915, Einstein completed his theory of general relativity and he computed now the deflection of light. And there is a factor of two difference between the original value and the value in the general relativity. The original value that Einstein derived uh, is the same that we can derive using uh, Newton's uh, 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 gravity. But the full general relativity it's uh, this deflection angle. And in 1919, there was again an expedition, again to Brazil. Uh, it seems that uh, 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 the lead of the expedition in the, the um, uh, sorry, I forgot his name, um, from uh, UK, he didn't want to come to Brazil because it rained the other time, but still there were two expeditions, one to Prince Island and the other to Sobral to Brazil. And both expeditions could actually see the uh, eclipse and the detection of uh, bending of light. Uh, actually, there's a lot of discussion in the literature, but the data that was uh, taken in Sobral in Brazil was better. Uh, you could see more stars. And in any case, uh, the results were in agreement with the general theory of relativity, the general relativity theory, and not with the Newtonian theory. So uh, once, uh, uh, for the first time, you had a new prediction of general relativity that was validated with data, and that was the deflection of light. So Einstein wrote once, once he visited to Brazil, um, in German, but uh, the question that my mind formulated was answered by the sky of Brazil. He was very happy because he became like a pop star uh, after this, uh, this confirmation of the light deflect. Uh, but he could have said, this, thanks Brazil twice. First, for the cloudy skies, because uh, if they could observe the eclipse, they would see a factor of two difference. And then when he would fix his theory, relativity would not be a prediction. So it would... Uh, uh, you know, it, it would be much worse for the history of general relativity. So he was lucky that with the wrong prediction, it was raining, and with the right prediction, it was tiny. Anyway, so that's a deflection of light. Uh, as you know, in general relativity, we express the geometry by a metric, and I will not go into any detail of, uh, of uh, general relativity here. I know half of the audience is graduate students. Most of the other half is PhD students, so I guess you're not familiar with general relativity. But just to say, like in words, that uh, we write the geometry as, as a metric and we connect the, the, the coordinates and, and uh, we connect what is physical quantities with what are the coordinates through this metric. So what you see here is an expression of the, um, of the interval 
uh, between events. And uh, you see here, uh, the, there's a first uh, term with a phi, that's a gravitational potential. There's a second term with a phi, that's the same gravitational potential in this situation in general relativity. Uh, perhaps tomorrow we'll talk about modification, testing modifications of general relativity. And one possible modification is that these two potentials are not the same. But in general relativity, in this situation, they are the same potential. So it's phi, is the Newtonian potential, right? And uh, the light propagates uh, in curves that we call geodesics, where the, this ds square is zero. Okay, so I can, uh, if I make ds square zero, uh, this, this sigma square is like a distance, so I can compute a sort of a velocity, okay? And this, is, uh, this will give a, an effective velocity of propagation, which uh, for a small values of phi, so phi over c square, much smaller than one, which is the weak field approximation, this gives you an effective velocity. So uh, once we compute uh, uh, a refraction index, that's the velocity of light divided by the velocity of light in a medium. That's a refraction index, right? So we can associate to the propagation of light in gravity to a refraction index, like the propagation of light in a medium. And, and this, uh, 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 um, this formal connection is, uh, is a exact connection in the weak field limit in the sense that the solution of the geodesic motion is really like uh, the solution of uh, the Fermat principle of light in a medium with a varying uh, um, refraction index, okay? And this helps uh, uh, us to understand a bit what's what is going on. Any questions so far? Okay, so uh, the, usually in the situations where we have the uh, gravitational lensing, we have a source that is, uh, let's say, compact, that's small compared to the distances involved. So basically, light travels in a straight line until it gets close to the, to the lens, which is the object that deflects the light, uh, and it gets bent by an angle A hat, and then it goes straight to us. Okay, so this angle A hat is what Einstein computed, and in the case of general relativity in the weak field limit, is this expression here, four times G times M over C squared, divided by Xi, and Xi here, the impact parameter, okay? And the result from Newtonian theory is half of this value. Okay, good. So uh, you, you see that there is no dependence on the, on the frequency of light uh, in, the, in the geometric optics. Okay, so we treat really as a straight light. Um, and of, so the effect is achromatic. It will not change the spectrum of the objects, right? Okay, so keeping with our uh, little um, history, uh, so Einstein uh, made the first predictions in 2011, 2012, and the, the bending was detected in 1919. Um, and the first paper really to discuss gravitational lensing was a paper not very popular, but this person, Schlosson, in, in 1924, uh, where he predicted the appearance of more, um, two images and uh, 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 what is called an Einstein ring. Uh, so we should maybe call this uh, Schlosson-Einstein rings. Einstein was aware of gravitational lensing, as I said before, but he thought that, uh, besides the, the, the deflection of light by the sun, he thought that lensing, what we, we, we understand by lensing nowadays, uh, was not uh, uh, to detect. So he never published that. Until 1936, where someone was like pushing him to publish, and then he published his paper, although he had made this calculation earlier. But he was very pessimistic. Of course, there's no much hope, much hope of observing this phenomenon directly. That was his thinking about lensing of a star by a star. He thought, as we will see, that's very unlikely of this to be possible, and if it's possible, we'll never know, okay? But Zwicky was much more optimistic. Fritz Zwicky has been a, a measure the weight of galaxies and galaxy clusters, so he knew that there is a lot of mass in these objects. So he thought, well, the lensing of a, of, a, of a galaxy by a galaxy or a galaxy by a galaxy cluster then this would be very likely. So he said the probability that nebulae, which was a name for the galaxies, which act as gravitational lenses that will be found becomes practically a certainty. And in this case, he was right. So in 1930, uh, 1979 was the first detection of lensing. What you see in this picture in the bottom left, uh, in, uh, the bluish images are two images of the same color, and there is reddish uh, Im image somewhat in the between, which is the lens galaxy. So that was the first discovery of a gra gravitational lens. Uh, since then, we've been discovering a lot of expressions of this phenomenon. In 1986, the first gravitational arc, you see in the second picture from top to bottom, you see like an arc, 
uh, that's a, a gravitational arc in a galaxy cluster, and then it was found in other clusters. And then uh, an Einstein ring, uh, like you see in the bottom image, the first was in the radio in 1998. Then quasar microlensing, which is the lensing of multiple imaged quasars by stars in a galaxy. We'll mention that uh, tomorrow. Um, and then the first discovery of uh, compact objects uh, in the galaxy, which could be stars, brown dwarfs, black holes, uh, lensing other galaxies in our star. Uh, in 2003, the first discovery of a planet being lensed. Uh, and in this, this 21st century, we have been having so many expressions of this, this phenomenon that I'm not even naming them, but weak lensing is now used in all scales from galaxies to large scale structure of the universe. That will be a subject we'll, we'll discuss tomorrow. Uh, strong lensing, many galaxies and galaxy clusters, uh, microlensing in, in various forms, even uh, asymmetric microlensing, you see a shift in the position of the star, uh, lensing of transient objects like supernovae, or even strong lensing of individual stars, very distant galaxies. Like we heard, I think, a couple of weeks, there was a, a lot of this in the news. Okay, so uh, what are the effects of gravitational lensing in general? Uh, it may produce multiple images. It will not always do so, but it produces multiple images of distant objects, distortions in the shape of these objects, magnifications of the light of these objects, so increasing the flux from them, time delays. If there are two images of the same object and then they vary in time, there will be a delay between different images. And as we said, this is an achromatic effect. Uh, as surface brightness is conserved, um, if, if the object looks bigger, if they're larger, it will also be more magnified. We just get more photons from it. So it really can act as a gravitational telescope, though it distorts the image. But we can uh, map the distortion, model the distortion, and map it back to the shape of the, the original shape of the object that distorted. Uh, and what is very interesting for us is sensitive, of course, to everything that gravitates, uh, either if it shines or not shine. So it's sensitive to planets, to dark matter. It's a unique probe of the structure of the universe, which is dominated by dark matter, uh, from the galaxies to large structure. And as we will see, the distances that are involved uh, in the cosmological uh, setting are cosmological distances. They depend on the cosmological model. So it's also a way to probe uh, the large scale uh, uh, background cosmology of the universe. So this is a picture of a strong lensing example where you have uh, the Earth, a distant source, and a cluster in the mid, in, the, in between, and it generates these uh, arc images uh, that you see in the right. This is an HST image. What you see from the Earth is more like this. Uh, so gravitational arcs are low surface brightness objects. They are uh, uh, very thin compared to uh, the, the, the PSF, the resolution of the instruments. So it's not very easy to find these objects. Uh, there's a lot of work being done in finding these objects. Uh, we were involved in some challenges, uh, uh, computational challenges to find these objects. But I don't think I will mention this at all during this course. Any questions so far? From here or from the web? OK. So lensing is essentially a mapping of two planes, like a mathematical mapping, right? We have the source plane which is where, like, let's say that the real uh, images would be if we don't have lensing. Uh, that's the source plane where, the, plane, where the, the sources are located. And we have the lens plane where we actually observe. Okay, so we, we can think of lensing as something that maps the source plane into the lens plane. This is where, let's say, uh, reality is, where the objects are located, and this is what we will see actually in our telescopes, right? So if we know this mapping, we know everything. Uh, so here's a drawing in the right. It's so weird not to have a mouse. Um, so you see a source in the top. Uh, it, uh, the, the light propagates. It crosses the lens. So we think in here the lens is small compared to the distances involved. So that's the thin lens approximation. Um, the deflection al alpha uh, angle is this alpha hat that you see there. The, the, um, the, what we call uh, the... Um, uh, Okay, so that's a nomenclature problem that uh, let me try to clarify. Uh, sometimes we call impact parameter the position of the source, like eta here. And sometimes we call impact parameter psi. Okay, so let's try to make this uh, at least, since sometimes the same word is used, eta is the position of the source, and psi is the maximum approximation of the light ray to the center of the lens. Okay? Um, so 
in many occasions, especially in microlensing, we will call eta the impact parameter, okay, the position of the source relative to the optical axis, okay, okay, and and so the coordinates that we use often to uh, to refer to these two planes are these coordinates eta. These are two dimensional, so it's like a vector. Uh, eta in the source plane, psi in the in the lens plane. Sometimes we use these angular coordinates, beta in the source plane, theta in the lens plane. And sometimes we use uh, dimensionless coordinates, which are very useful for many reasons, including for coding. And we usually use uh, the notation y for the lens plane and x, uh, sorry, y for the source plane and x for the lens plane. Okay. So as, as these are, uh, uh, of course, these are spherical coordinates, but the distances involved are really very small. So we can think them as like, uh, like uh, Cartesian vectors, this beta, theta, for, for most applications, okay? Um, okay, so now we, we understand these two planes and we want to know the mapping between one to the other. Um, the, the propagation of light uh, doesn't need to be in a single plane. I mean, this trajectory from the source to the observer can make like a switch, okay? If the, the lens is not spherically symmetric, the light ray will not only be deflected uh, in the direction uh, um, from the center of the lens, but also can be tilted, okay? That's why we do this 2D drawing, this 3D drawing, right? But uh, let's now think 2D, which is easier to think. So that's uh, light propagation in a plane. Uh, this way it will happen, for example, for a spherically symmetric object, it would just be simpler to, to see, to watch, but we can, the, 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 the equations that will be derived, they are uh, correct for the right-hand side too. But let's look at the left-hand side, because uh, life will be simpler. So first thing we want to, to do is connect the deflection angle, which is the alpha hat, which is where the physics is, which is the value that I saw before for a, a, a point lens uh, computed by Einstein. So let's compare this, uh, the, the angles that we see, which is theta, what we would actually see in, in our telescope. Let's compare with beta, which would be what we see without the lensing. Okay, what, what we call the source plane, and how we connect these this three variables, uh, which makes very simple uh, uh, trigonometry. Remember that the angles are very small. They are smaller than arc seconds of the order of, or smaller of arc seconds. So basically, sinus x is x, tangent x is x, and so on. So you can be convinced very easily that the connection between these angles is what I show here. Beta times the distance from observer to source is equal to theta, times the distance from observer to source minus deflection angle uh, times the distance of the lens to the source, okay? So this is what we call the lens equation. It will be the basis for everything lensing, okay? Um, first, let's uh, uh, introduce, an, um, uh, let's make a very simple manipulation. Uh, let's introduce this uh, reduced deflection angle, which is alpha, what's, what would be the effect of the deflection angle uh, between beta and theta. Okay, so we just, uh, I just take this equation and let's divide by dOS and then we'll get the uh, expression uh, beta is equal to theta minus alpha of theta, right? Remember, the alpha comes from the deflection angle but is multiplied by dLS over dOS. So this is the lens equation in the form you use every single time. And again, uh, in the cosmological setting, uh, the metric will change with respect to what I, I've shown at the beginning. I've shown a metric, which is a perturbation of Minkowski, of the flat metric. But we can go to a, a, a universe where the metric is friedman metric robertson walker is a homogeneous universe, and you can redo everything, and you'll find exactly the same equations in the regimes that we are dealing with, except that the distances will be the cosmological angular diameter distances. So this equation that I'm showing is also valid on a cosmological setting, where you have the, the, the distances uh, uh, made by the angular diameter distances, which you cannot sum. So DOL plus DO, DLS is not DOS, okay? But that's the only detail there. And just to remember the physics, the nature of the lens uh, will be in the, uh, in the angle of deflection. Any questions so far? All this in the weak field approximation, yes. Uh, yeah. In a, in a gravity regime or very close to a compact shape 
yeah, the equation changes. And also the monochromaticity will change. Also, you have the combined effect of the of the frequency due to the uh, gravitational relative while the ray is uh, bending. Okay, so yes, first, uh, this is only on the weak field in the gym. Yeah. Um, this will be valid in, in all the classes that I would discuss uh, in this setting. But for example, if you want to study like the rings of light and black hole shadows, you cannot use this. Yeah. You have to go into the strong field. Uh, for the situations we are concerned, like galaxies being landed, star clusters being landed, planetary systems, and so on, uh, the relativistic corrections will be negligible. Um, regarding the chromaticity, it's achromatic uh, as long as we use the geometric optics. But as I will mention later today, if you take into account wave optics, then it's not achromatic anymore, even in the weak field approximation. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, any other question? So as I mentioned before, uh, everything we need to know is uh, in between the mapping of the, plan, the, the source to the lens plane and this, map, this, this uh, mapping locally is encoded in the Jacobian of the transformation from the two planes, right? D beta over D theta. So if I know this Jacobian matrix, I know all the local properties of, the, of the, how the uh, source is mapped into an image, right? And it turns out that this Jacobian can be written as the matrix identity minus the second derivative of a potential. So it's a, a, it's a diagonal uh, form. Um, and this potential is exactly the Newtonian gravitational potential projected along the line of sight from the source to the observer, okay, weighted by the distances as you can see in this formula here. So this uh, 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 quantity psi that we call uh, the, the lensing potential is the projected uh, Newtonian gravitational potential weighted by these uh, uh, cosmological distances. Um, so here you can see where the physics of the source is, providing phi. That's the only thing, the only dependence on the lens, sorry, not the source. The only dependence on the lens properties is on the potential uh, that this lens will produce and uh, on the cosmological distances as we see here. And we can uh, uh, diagonalize this matrix and you can write it at, as we see in the, in the right. So the inverse of this matrix, of the, the inverse of this matrix, will give of this uh, uh, Jacobian of this matrix, the inverse, will, will, will tell me the mapping from the source to the lens. And its eigenvalues will tell me how the source is stretched in the two main directions, okay? So it's a diagonal matrix. It has two uh, eigen uh, uh, vectors and two eigenvalues. And so the, the eigenvectors will tell me the two directions where the stretch is, right, in the, the linearized uh, uh, infinitesimal uh, uh, or very small source. And, and it, we can write these magnifications as we see in the right. So one minus kappa plus gamma, it's what we call usually for a sort of a spherical object, is the, 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 the radial magnification and one minus kappa minus gamma would be a tangential magnification. So the term in the, the left, uh, if, you, if you have the, uh, the lens here, it will be a distortion in this direction, and the second term, a distortion in this direction, tangential distortion, right? And these quantities, kappa and gamma, they are derived, of course, from the, this uh, second derivative of phi. Kappa is the Laplacian of, of, of psi, sorry. Kappa is the Laplacian of, of psi, uh, um, is the, the the trace of the matrix, and gamma is made out of the traceless parts. Okay, so both kappa and gamma, they depend on the potential phi through the second derivatives. That's the, the important thing. And if uh, an object is very massive, and if the, uh, the, uh, um, this kappa and this gamma, of course, are a function of the distance, let's think of a spherical lens. So kappa and gamma are a function of r. Okay, very far away from the lens, kappa and gamma are zero. There is no lensing. But as we go towards the center of the lens, if the lens is very concentrated, if the density gets very high in the, in the center, uh, kappa and gamma can also be very large. That can be even larger. So you see kappa goes from zero to something larger than one, or gamma from zero to something closer uh, to one. So it means that the, the, the denominator of any of these two uh, magnifications may vanish, and that will give you infinite magnification. So that's a strong lensing effect. Right? If these things are small, of course, we can linearize, but we will also always have this effect of stretching in two directions. 
and the, 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 the magnification is just the product of these two stretch is minus, uh, my one times my, my two, okay? So if you take like a circular source, uh, it will become, if it, we are taking an infinitesimal circular source, so it will be mapped into an ellipse, okay, in this um, linear transformation. And the ratio of the axis of the ellipse will be given by the ratio of the axis of these two eigenvalues, okay? And the, the size of the ellipse will be the product of these eigenvalues. So now we introduced uh, regions where these eigenvalues can vanish, and we call this caustics. So in the, in the, the left uh, uh, panel, you see a plot with two caustics, okay? Uh, one caustic that's called asteroid, that's like a kind of a star. Um, so if you put something close to that asteroid, it will be very stretched in the tangential direction. And the external uh, uh, um, um, caustic, uh, which is more like oval-like, it will make a radial stretching, right? So here we put sources at different positions. Um, so you see that the outermost source in uh, violet, it uh, has a single image, it's a little bit distorted. And as we go closer to the center of the lens, uh, like the, um, uh, what's called cyan, uh, cyan uh, one, uh, it's, it's stretched in the radial direction, but is also motor image. Once you cross a caustic, you always gain an uh, image, okay? So uh, uh, um, you gain, normally you gain uh, two images when you cross a caustic, right? So uh, here you, you cross a caustic with the cyan uh, uh, object, and, and you have here, um, well, um, you have the outmost image, you have a set of, I, I even don't know the number, a set of images that go uh, close to the, are mapped close to the center of the lens, okay? The number of images, well, uh, there are some numerical things also because if there is a diversion in the sense, in the center, things get the, the numerically more complicated, but we'll leave this to the, to the questions. The important thing is that you cross the, the, the caustic and then you gain a multiplicity of the images. And once you go closer to the center of the lens, like the blue one, you see uh, also um, one, two, and three images in the center. And uh, the, the um, green one, you see uh, one, two, three, four, uh, maybe there is a five-ish image uh, in the center that you don't see. And th this is a large arc, which is the merger of two images, actually, okay? It's crossing the tangential critical curve. And in the center, you see this called Einstein cross uh, uh, situation where you have these four images. So uh, the, the take message here is that if you are far from the caustics, you have a single image. Each time you cross a caustic, you gain normally two images, uh, unless you have a divergence, then we can discuss. And uh, so these, uh, these um, caustics, they, on, at the same time, they limit, the, they are the regions of you have infinite magnification, but they also are boundaries that uh, uh, determine the multiplicity of the images, okay? And the images of the caustics in the lens plane, we call them critical curves. So the image of this uh, um, internal um, kind of cross caustic, is this external critical curve, and the image of this external uh, uh, caustic is the internal critical curve on the lens plane. And you can play a little bit with this. I don't know if people uh, uh, remotely, they can see it, but that's a glass of wine. Here in Argentina, we appreciate a lot of wine and produce very good wines, um, but I'm not drinking now. I, this, this part of the, of the glass uh, represents quite well uh, one of these um, analogs of the light deflection by the potential of a point source. Um, so the, this shape here. And I don't know if you will be able to see remotely, maybe, I don't know. Uh, here there is a dot in the, in the whiteboard. And you guys here, you can see later. Uh, if you look through the bottom of the, of the glass, you will see arcs or even a full Einstein ring. Okay, so this is exactly this effect. And on the other hand, if you use, uh, you make your light propagate through the glass, you see here, if you look at the center of the glass, uh, yes, here, yes, better. Okay, so let me repeat the, <laughs> let me repeat the, the bluish thing. Let's see if they see the Einstein rings. So can you see? 
maybe. Well, maybe you're seeing some, some arcs or Einstein rings, not sure. But let's see the caustics. So if you see close to the, to, the, to the center of the bottom of the lens, you see this asteroid uh, shape. If I make this more elliptical, uh, you see it more like an asteroid. If I make this more uh, spherically symmetric, you see a point. So that's the, the, the caustic. OK. Good. <laughs> OK, you can try at home with a glass. And, and to make some publicity, buy a, a good Argentinian wine and make uh, fill it your glass with the Argentinian wine then. OK, so these are the, the caustics and critical curves. These are the magnifications. Um, so this is part of our super basics of gravitational lensing. And as I said, if there is an infinitesimal source, then the uh, magnification will be infinite. But of course, the sources are finite size. And then when you cross a caustic, you don't have infinite magnifications. But the smallest the source, the highest the magnification possible. So that's why you can measure sometimes the magnifications of hundreds uh, for a star. OK, okay good. So let's talk a little bit about the regimes of gravitational lensing. So here's a picture. You have a, a source, which may be a background galaxy or a star in the right. You have the lens in the middle, which may be a galaxy or a galaxy cluster or, or a star. And uh, you have the trajectory some, of some light rays. If the if deflection is, is large enough, that you can make multiple images, which means that one of, of the two denominators at least has regions where it is vanished. Uh, you need the presence of caustics and uh, critical curves to make multiple images. But once you go far from the optical axis, or if the lens is not so uh, massive, you have small distortions like uh, weak shear. So one of the classifications is when the effect is strong or weak. Weak meaning a small distortion, or strong meaning large distortions or even multiple images. And just to re remind you, this is the lens equation. On the right uh, side is the projected uh, uh, Newtonian potential. Then we have the weighting of the cosmological distances. And that's the mapping connecting uh, image, which is theta, uh, to the source plane, which is beta. OK, okay good. So that's uh, uh, models of the lens uh, mass distribution will give me values of phi. And my background cosmology will give me the cosmological distances. OK, so there, as I said, there is the classification between the, uh, uh, relating to the strength of the phenomena, strong lensing and weak lensing. Besides magnification, multiple images and distortions, we may also have these time differences. And in weak lensing, we have this small uh, distortion, which uh, 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 is detected like a twist uh, on, on the shape of galaxies. And we'll discuss this tomorrow. It's detected only statistically, not in each object that's lensed. Uh, regarding the angular scale, uh, we have macro lensing, which is kind of what we see the shapes. So this is when we have galaxies or galaxy clusters or the large scale structure of the universe. Then the, 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 the shape, the effects on the shape of the, of the background sources is what we can measure. But when the, the source uh, is very small, uh, like a, a quasar or like a star, then we have micro lensing. So in the case of micro lensing by stars, for example, we don't see the two images. We don't see the shape of the image. But uh, as there is a dynamic phenomenon, as we will see uh, right now, uh, we, we, we can see changes on the, the magnification. So really, it's the, in, in micro lensing, really what we see are, are time variations, whereas in macro lensing, what we see are, let's say, shape differences. It is a, usually a static process, unless you have some transient like a, like a lensed supernova. Uh, and recently, we have seen many other uh, uh, regimes of lensing, uh, well, like astrometric microlensing, when see the position of the, of the source, black hole shadow, which is deep into the strong um, gravity regime, retrolensing, it's another uh, example of strong gravity lensing. There is femtolensing that I will measure and mention very briefly, but it's a typically uh, wave optics effect. Uh, there is lensing of gravitational waves, which we are not discussing here, but it's quite similar uh, to, to, to lensing of, uh, of light uh, and so on. Uh, lensing of gravitational waves has not been detected yet. Femton lensing neither, but I'm sure they will be. 
soon. Uh, also, to make some uh, Argentinian-oriented publicity, there is a, a, a nice book uh, on gravitational lensing, short and very, very, very nice, uh, by Silvia Morerach and Esteban Rolet, which are in, in Bariloche, you might know. Uh, that's this nice uh, book. Okay. Uh, before we go to microlensing, let me just give you one example of, uh, of a strong lensing that I think is extremely powerful. And um, we, we will later see a little bit how this works. I, I'll, I'll just show pictures. I'll, I'll not show any, any math. Uh, but tomorrow, when we discuss strong lensing, we will see a very simplified uh, problem uh, which is connected to this one, okay? But that, I'll just show you a, a, an example of a, a system that uh, has so much information uh, and, um, okay, I won't speak, but you'll see what, what, what I'm talking about. So this, uh, this is a galaxy cluster that's been observed by Hubble. It's a Hubble uh, uh, frontier field. Um, you see, it's a pity I don't have a mouse, but if you look closer to the center of the image, you see a spiral galaxy. Actually, there is this inset where you see the, the details of the galaxy. A little bit upper left to the inset, you see also a spiral galaxy, which is actually uh, same image, multiple image of the spiral galaxy. And if you look in the diagonal upper, you see another image of the spiral galaxy. And close to the center of the cluster, there's another image of the spiral galaxy. So that's a spiral galaxy behind the galaxy cluster that is lensed by the overall potential of the cluster. And you see many images of the uh, of the spiral galaxy. It happens that there is in the bottom image, the one that is in the inset, there is also a galaxy cluster member, so an individual galaxy from that cluster, that's lensing the spiral arm of this galaxy. You don't see these in the other images because this is a, a single lens, a single uh, galaxy on the cluster that's lensing a piece of only one of the images, okay? And it turns out that there was a supernova explosion in the spiral arm. And this spiral arm has multiple images. So what you see with the arrows are four images of the supernova that took place in this spiral arm, okay? So what we see here is the overall image, uh, uh, the, the overall potential of the cluster making multiple images of the, gal of the, the spiral galaxy. And in one of the arms, a supernova is taking place. And, a, and one of the galaxy clusters is multiply imaging this supernova, okay? We can model this system. We can make a model, we can reconstruct the, 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 the mass density of this very complex structure, and we'll see what we can do once we do that. Um, so we, we, make, uh, uh, we use the multiple images, not only the spiral galaxy, but many multiple images that can be identified in that image. We use these positions, the light distribution, to, to, to make this inversion, to map the, the lens plane to the source plane. Multiple images should be uh, imaged to the same place, right? So we'll see in more details how, how this is done, but this is what, what we need to know for now. So we will take as inputs for the modeling the multiple images of the several sources that are multiply imaged uh, behind that uh, galaxy cluster. Uh, we will use the, the known galaxy cluster members, the, the lenses, the, the galaxies that are part of the galaxy cluster. We will use them as lenses. Each one ha will have a, a dark matter halo. We will also use, uh, I say we, but I didn't model this system, okay? It's they, they, okay? But we as a community. Um, so uh, we use this um, um, a model for the overall halo of the, 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 the galaxy cluster. In some cases, we need more than a halo because this galaxy cluster may be the result of a merger. So we consider as inputs the positions and as variables that we'll model uh, is the 2D mass distribution, right? Uh, there, are, there are ways to do it non-parametrically and there are ways to do it parametrically. What I'm describing today is parametrically. We make parameters like the mass of the, of the cluster halo, the axis of the cluster halo, the orientation of the cluster halo, the mass to light ratio, of each of the, 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 the lens galaxies, the profile of the lens galaxies, and so on and so forth. So we have a lot of parameters. We have uh, uh, hundreds of multiple images, hundreds of param parameters, and then we reconstruct the, the, the dense distribution of the lens, okay? This can provide a lot of information. Of course, all the, the, the light, uh, all the mass distribution. Also, because we have sources at multiple distances, we can also constrain the cosmology. I'm not sure if I'll, ha I'll have time tomorrow to show an example. Uh, that's 
we did an example. I can use the we here. Um, uh, so, um, but anyway, so uh, to control the cosmology. But there's a lot of information that can be derived. The question is, can, does this make sense? And how can we know all this that sounds so complicated, so nonlinear? Maybe it's even a, a ill-posed problem. How do we know that this works, right? Do we have like an independent confirmation of this? And this is all what science is about, right? Especially in physics, we want to make predictions and we want to make them falsifiable. We want to make, make predictions that we can, it's a prediction, we want to say something before it's observ observed. That's the power of physics, the power of predictions. Then it's falsifiable, uh, we can confirm or not. And this supernova gave the, the, the opportunity to make a falsifiable prediction, which is, okay, we see the supernova in, in one of the images, will it show up in another image? And that's the question. So there were a lot of, of modeling, a lot, uh, several groups uh, uh, put a lot of time into modeling this system. Uh, here I underline Gabriel, it's a former student. They make a prediction that there will be another image and its peak luminosity should occur, peak luminosity should occur between March and June 2016. That's a prediction. Uh, but there is an uncertainty, of course. And other peoples did the same. They modeled the system. They, they also, they predicted the relative flux in the supernova, which was already there. They could check if their prediction was good or bad. That's what you see in the left. But the most important is that they predicted, like here, no, between November and January, November 2015, and January 2016 should appear the, the, the new image. There were predictions. So people kept spotting this object with Hubble to see what's going on. So this was observed in 2014. In another image, it should have happened in 1995. In another one, 1964. But in this image, it was predicted to happen in the future, okay? Sometime in between 2015 and 2020. So here, as you see, S1, S2, S3, S4 are the sites of the supernovae before they occur. Once a supernova occurs and they have four images, and SX is the prediction of where and when and with which magnification should this image appear. And that was it. <laughs> I think this is really, really amazing. I, I, it's fantastic. Uh, so these are comparison of three groups uh, with some confidence region where the object would appear. Right, uh, Grillo et al., Diego et al., Josac et al., and there is the object. Okay, so this works. Uh, so yes, uh, and below is, is Refsal, uh, who worked in the 60s in the in lensing and discussed the lensing of supernova, and in the top is uh, Karl Popper, philosopher of science. Okay, good. So we are done with the first part. Are there questions so far? So as I said, we had a change in, in the program. We'll, we'll not have the coffee break now. So you have to hear me talking again for one hour. Uh, we can make a few seconds break. For those that are at home, maybe uh, sip a, a, a cup of coffee. So really, yeah, let, let's make a... 30 second break or one minute break or bathroom. Okay, one minute and a half break. Okay, <laughs> if you want to drink water, get coffee. I'm here for the questions. Say. Very bad. I, I really get uh, emotional with this. <laughs> it's very impressive. So for